you know, sedimentation. And we talked about the fact that the currents of the ocean are, are important for the organisms because, uh, for example, things like upwelling make it possible for life forms to live near the surface where the nutrients would otherwise not be if it wasn't for the cur upwelling current where it takes the nutrients from the bottom where the decomposition actually takes place back to the top uh, where nutrients are necessary for photosynthesizers to actually do their jobs. Now, this video will focus mostly on the actual uh, types of life forms that live in the oceans and the different environments that these life forms will live in. And uh, we have basically three major classifications for life forms in terms of aquatic ecosystems uh, on the oceans. And they are very funky little names, and you can find them written down on the lecture guide, and I'll try to write them down. If you hear it, you see on the left side, uh, you see things like octopus, fish, um, sharks. Um, these are all kinds of animals of all kinds of different species. For example, this is a cephalopod, uh, which is a mollusk. And over here you have um, a dolphin, which is actually a mammal. And then you have lots of kinds of fish, including lungfish and uh, ray fin fish and all, all the kinds of fish. So these are different, different species and actually even different families and different groups of, 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 of super classes of animals. But the point is, if this animal or organism is able to freely swim by itself against the current or with the current, whatever way it chooses within the ocean. We call them a nacton. Nacton. And a lot of the things that people think about when they think about oceans are these are animals which we can actually swim freely in the oceans. So these are things that have fins and and uh, things that have like um, some sort of propulsion system that can actually swim with or against the currents. Uh, then there's the, uh, the bottom dwellers, or the animals that live deep within the, wa the water and live in the bottom of the ocean. They're mo mostly decomposers or detrivores. They eat the dead materials off the bottom of the ocean, or they feed on bacteria, which do that. Uh, and so these are bottom dwellers like sea stars, sand dollars, uh, lobsters, and sea urchins, and all kinds of animals like that. And you see them here, right, on the bottom here, uh, buckets full of them. And we call these benthos benthos because they bathe on the ocean water live in the bottom of the, uh, the water that's what it's called now in the left side over here I'm sorry the right side over here we have a group of animals which are microscopic and some of even have swimming apparatus or materials to propose, propose themselves but when everything is said and done they can barely shift their position here and there but mostly they move with the currents in other words the oceans take them wherever the oceans are trying to take them so if they're trapped in a current they pretty much go wherever the current is taking them they don't have a choice um, these are, are organisms which are basically dissolve in the ocean water and move with the currents as opposed to nectons would actually swim freely and these are called plankton 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 now, I'm sure that those of you who actually watched SpongeBob, you've heard of plankton before. And what it means is that they, they're kind of planted in the water, but not in the bottom of the water, but in the water itself. They're, they're part of the water. And so wherever the water goes, they go with it. Now, there's basically two major types of plankton. You have zooplankton and then phytoplankton. And so zooplankton is the equivalent of animals or heterotrophs, so it's any type of plankton which cannot make its own food and must eat to survive, something like this, something like uh, brine shrimp or krill, these first two in the top here uh, are examples of, uh, of zooplankton. And then you also have phytoplankton, now phytoplankton is producers or any type of plankton that will make its own food uh, based on the sunlight or, or uh, chemical reactions or anything else and it does not need to eat to survive but it only needs basic nutrients and, and things like sunlight in order to perform its activities and examples of this would be algae or cyanobacteria or other bacteria that live near volcanic vents and things like that so plankton are life forms that live it can make their own uh, food so these are the autotroph version of plankton and this is the, zoo, uh, the heterotroph version of plankton so you have heterotroph here and out of the trough there. So that's what it, what it means. Now well, these are the three major categories of animals. Planktons, which uh, are carried with the currents and don't swim freely in the oceans. Nactons, which choose where to go with or against the currents. And benthos, which live in crawling in the bottom of the water. All right? Now when it comes down to uh, e ecosystems within the uh, oceans, there's lots of types of ecosystems. and But 
these ecosystems are basically divided into zones of life in the ocean and you can see these zones uh, uh, displayed here and basically now when it comes to the actual um, zones of life in the ocean we have two major areas of the ocean we have the bottom of the ocean which is the where the benthos would be living and this refers to the actual sand or the rock that's in the bottom of the water and so anything living in those areas is considered living in the benthic zones and then you have the uh, the water zones which are which are referred to as pelagic zones and you see up here the name for that so the water zones will be considered animals which are either plankton or nekton and are living in the water itself not in the land that's underneath the water and so these are the two major differences. Now let's start talking about the different benthic zones. Now, the, make, the first benthic zone is called the littoral or the sub intertidal zone. And this is the zone that is sometimes above water, sometimes below water. And so that's where you see things like uh, sand dollars and, and uh, some crabs and, and uh, things like that living in those areas, which are sometimes covered with water, sometimes underneath the water. So you see moss, you see algae. You see uh, some simple sea plants and a lot of these things living in these areas. Now, the sublittoral zone is actually very interesting because it's the out of the ocean is the area that's the that sees the most change in biotic factors over over day and night over over the course of the day because when when the tide comes in, it's underwater. When the tide comes out, it's above water. So you, you go from an aquatic environment to a land environment all in the same day more than one time a day depending on what the tides are doing and so this is the area that sees the greatest change in biotic fa abiotic factors throughout the day so make sure that you know that that's important then you have the sublittoral zone now this is the zone that's sitting right under the continent sorry right up well, it's, it's basically right on top of the continental shelf so this is the sublittoral zone that's um right there near the continents constantly being hit by sedimentation and runoff from the continents and so it's going to have a lot of lot of lot of lot of nutrients and so you will find a lot of life in these areas here in the in the oceans uh, and this is perhaps the richest of all the benthic zones where you would have a lot a lot a lot of life found in the sublittoral zone and there's a special uh, ecosystem that is present in some areas of the sublittoral zone. Normally, sublittoral zones are nutrient rich, but if you find a nutrient poor sublittoral zone, you can have the growth of something that we call the coral reef, which is um, some people refer to as the um, as the uh, rain, rainforest of the oceans. And I don't like actually that because it makes you think that it has a lot of, of different um, uh, nutrients in that area. But in fact. Rainforest and coral reefs both don't have that many nutrients. The nutrients are in the life itself. But the water is not nutrient rich the same way that the, set, the, the ground of the rainforest is not actually nutrient rich. It's the life that's rich. It's a lot of biodiversity. It's pretty, it's colorful, um, but it only has to be in a nutrient poor water. Uh, coral reefs have to be carbonate rich water or water that's nutrient poor too many nutrients will interfere with the formation of carbonates and they will interfere with that so coral reefs will only be present in places like sublittoral zones which are um, nutrient poor but it still needs to be sublittoral because it can't be too deep it has to be an area that's fairly shallow in order for the sunlight to hit the coral reef because uh, the coral lives in symbiotic relationships with algae and so you need to have those um, things now the beautiful thing about it is that algae usually, usually needs nutrients to survive, but in coral reefs, algae gets the nutrients out of the coral, and the coral gets the food out of the algae. So that's how it, it works out, and that's what's beautiful. We'll see a picture of that later. Now another major area would be we consider the bathyo zones. Now bathyo zones are the uh, basically the zones in the continental slope. So these are animals that live attached to the to the steep incline of the uh, of the ocean, and that you won't find that many animals living in that area. And then you find the abyssal zone, and this is the, referring to the abyssal plains. And you will find lots and lots of life in this area, especially um, things like um, decomposers, which are eating anything that's falling from the top of the water all the way to the bottom. So you find a lot of decomposers, and you also find things like. Um, volcanic bacteria which live near the mid-ocean ridges and ocean and sea mounts or any other volcanic uh, mountain and then you also have the hadal zone now this is the perhaps the the zone with the least life in the entire no not least life sorry with the least uh um 
the least we are known about, know the least about because the hell zone is is what it goes deep into the trenches and it's the deepest parts of the ocean 10,000 meters or below and so this is very very deep people but it's you still find life there because nutrients will still fall uh, to the bottom of the dead things and it'll fall into the uh, into the trenches and you still find decomposers and things like that and then you find life forms that eat those decomposers there as well now, in terms of the pelagic zones, there's two ways of dividing the pelagic zones. You can divide them vertically or horizontally. So you see the vertical divisions going this way, and then you see the horizontal divisions going this way. Now, you see the horizontal division has two basic divisions. You have the oceanic pelagic zone or the neuritic pelagic zone. Now, the neuritic pelagic zone refers to the, the water region that's sitting on top of the continental shelf. In other words, this is the nutrient-rich part of the ocean. And so this is where most of the life forms will live in the ocean. Most of the life forms will live in the erytic zone. That's where you find most of the plankton, most of the phyto and zooplankton, and most of the nekton and will be living in these areas. Why? Because this is the areas which are nutrient-rich in the oceans. In fact, if you asked, uh, because of the runoff that's coming off the continents, right, you would have a lot, a lot of nutrients in this area. And for also, whenever there is upwelling, it will pick up the decomposed material and the nutrients out of the hadal and abyssal zones and take those up towards the sublitoral zone. And so the upwelling will also take nutrients to the sub to the sublitoral and neuritic zones. And so the neuritic zone is the most nutrient rich area of the of of the oceans. What does that mean? It means that you will find the highest density of life in this area. That means life is packed into this area because there's a lot of nutrients and therefore there's going to be a lot of algae. Therefore, it's also the area of the ocean that has the highest density of productivity. That means that a lot of algae are producing uh, sugar per unit area using the sunlight, especially considering that's in the photic zone, which is the, which is the first 200 meters of the water. So it's very, a lot of algae you're going to find in this area. And so that is the most product productive the, uh, sorry, the, the highest density of production, the highest density of life, and the highest density of nutrients you will find in this in this uh, water. All right, Be both because of the continental runoff and because of upwelling. Then you have the pelagic zones. Now the pelagic zones refer to. The, then you have what is called the oceanic pelagic zones, or the areas of the ocean which are sitting on top of the deep ocean basins, and those can be divided vertically into other areas as well. Uh, the first area is the area that belongs to the photic zone. It's uh, just like the neuritic zone. And this is sitting in the open ocean. It's called the apipelagic zone. Now, even though it's out there in the open ocean, it doesn't have as much nutrients as the neuritic zone has because the, the upwelling will take the nutrients here and the runoff will take the nutrients here. And so the nutrients will be consumed here before they actually go to the open water. Now, there is some upwelling that happens in the open water. We talked about that in the previous video. But it doesn't usually bring water from way too deep. So it's not going to bring the nutrients from the abyssal pelagic zone all the way up there. And so the uh, epipelagic zone will, will be usually very nutrient poor water. With uh, It's going to be a carbonate ocean usually. And it's going uh, it's going to be having less uh, productivity than the neuritic zone will have. But even though it has less productivity per unit area, in terms of density, it's going to have less productivity, it is much more vast. Remember, 75% of the world is covered with oceans. So the majority of the world is covered with apipelagic zone. And therefore, even though that's very rare to you to find algae in this water, since there's so much of this in the world, this is the area of the world that's responsible for the most of the photosynthesis of the world. It's the most productive area of the world. It is the most photosynthetic area of the world. It's what makes the oxygen of the world because even though it has less density of productivity, it still has a lot more product production taking place just because it's a huge, huge area. And that's basically the epipelagic zone. As you go deeper than that, you hit the dysphotic zone, which is that thermocline where the temperature suddenly drops. And then life forms living here in the mesopelagic zone typically have to go up to eat from the from the either the neuritic or oceanic zones so life forms living deeper into the water usually go up to hunt and then you have the bathyopelagic and the abyssopelagic which are the deepest zones belonging to the aphotic zone of the ocean where light doesn't go in temperatures are dropping uh, really close to zero but not quite to zero because of the high pressure and in here you will have very very low productivity and because they have no basically no sunlight so that's going to be the least productive part of the ocean and therefore where you would find least life because most of the life here would either have to go up to eat after the pelagic zones on the top 
up or they have to go up to eat from the bottom dwellers which live in the abyssal or hadal zones and so there's going to be very little life living in the bathypelagic or abyssal pelagic zone and very almost no productivity in these areas here all right so in the next video we're going to do a review of these major concepts and also finish off with ocean resources